And from Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many people. They shall beat their swords and plowshares, and their spears in the pruning books. <clears throat> nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war no more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And from Matthew 26, verses 51 and 2. <coughs> Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Here ends the reading. I have to start this morning by saying that of all the issues that we decided to tackle in this series on issues that are dividing our nation, this is the one that I have dreaded the most. It is around this issue of gun violence and what to do about it that we seem to be most divided or most polarized as a nation. It is around this issue that the extreme voices on each side seem to shriek the loudest. I know that within this congregation, we have people who are huge gun proponents, and we also have people who have worked very hard to enact gun legislation. Despite attempts after every mass shooting in our country, we as a nation seem to have not been able to find any measurable amount of common ground on the issue of gun violence. Now in the interest of full disclosure, I have to say that I grew up in a household with guns, hunting guns. My dad and my brother were both hunters, as were, was one of my grandfathers at least. Lee and our boys have been hunters. All of our children have completed gun safety classes. We counted up this week and we presently have five guns in our home right now, all hunting guns. As far as I can remember, though, I have never shot a gun myself. I'm not very interested in hunting. I don't like venison. <laughs> but I have no problem with those who do. I spent a fair amount of time this week trying to research both sides of this issue. So I've been on the NRA website and other gun advocacy websites, as well as various websites promoting gun control. Those were actually the easy websites to find. It was more difficult to find unbiased information, strictly surveys or polls or st statistics or facts. But when I did, I was actually surprised by how much common ground there actually may be around this issue. In spite of the heated rhetoric that we hear from the extreme left and the extreme right, I believe that most people in our country find ourselves somewhere in the middle. The problem is that because we only hear 30 or 60 second sound bites, and because we mostly hear the extreme views, much of our nation's population is developing a pretty unhealthy fear of the other side and those people who are on the other side. Yes, we do have people who staunchly believe in gun control and gun regulation and want to see guns taken out of the hands of a lot of people in our country. And yes, we also have people who just as staunchly believe in gun rights to the point of adamantly resisting any legislation that would regulate gun ownership. But these are actually not the majority voices. They just garner the most airtime. They speak the loudest. Several of the polls that I read suggest that when we consider many of the issues involved in gun violence, a lot of us find ourselves somewhere in the middle, between the extreme views on either side. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time this morning 
on those areas where we might find some common ground. But then I would like us to go a little bit deeper. And I would like us to consider whether the gun violence that seems so prevalent in our nation now is the problem or whether it is a symptom of a deeper problem. As I was doing my research, I was surprised by several things that I found out. For instance, when you take out of the equation guns used for hunting and you limit um, your surveys to handguns, um, the people who buy those guns are typically in their late 40s to 50s and older. I would have thought that number would be much younger, but it's not. And the reason for gun ownership has changed in the last decade. The now the number one reason for owning a gun is personal safety. Hunting comes in second. Before this time, hunting has always been the number one reason for purchasing a gun. Gun sales in our nation continue to be very strong. In fact, just the other night I was reading about Bass Pro Shops acquiring Cabela's. And those of you who are outdoor enthusiasts know what I'm talking about. You've been in those stores. And as I read, I discovered that for the last several quarters, Cabela's has been able to record a profit only due to the rapidly increasing demand for firearms. Every other area of their store has not been able to record a profit. The civilian population in our nation owns over 310 million guns. The military and law enforcement agencies combined own four million guns. Do those numbers surprise you? They really surprised me. In fact, I didn't believe it the first time I read it. I had to look some more. So with gun ownership increasing and guns, um, the number of guns in people's homes increasing, I think there's a few questions that all of us should be concerned about. How do we keep people from accidentally harming themselves when guns are so readily available? And the much harder question, the much more difficult question for us to find common ground on, how do we keep guns from getting into the wrong hands? I think it would help to start with some facts. There are roughly 30,000 deaths from guns per year in our country. 30,000 people die from gun violence every year in our country. Of those 30,000 deaths, approximately 20,000 are self-inflicted. Two-thirds of the deaths from gun violence are self-inflicted. There is an undeniable but seldom mentioned connection between gun violence and suicide. Studies have shown that if there is a gun in the house and a suicidal person decides to use that gun, they are much more likely to succeed on their first attempt. In fact, Harvard did a study a few years ago and found that when people attempted suicide by ingesting pills, they were successful on their first attempt 2% of the time. But if they used a gun on their first attempt, they were successful 85% of the time. As a chaplain for the Hubbard County Sheriff's Department, I've been called out to some of those suicides. And I can just tell you that it is devastating for everyone who goes, who is involved in those. These numbers become even more important, I think, for us to pay attention to when we realize that about 17%, almost one in five of all teenagers think about suicide sometime during their high school years. <clears throat> one in five. The most tragic mishaps involving guns, um, the use of guns, happens when children find a gun belonging to a parent and accidentally kill themselves or someone else. 60 to 100 children every year take their own lives or the life of another child accidentally. And one study that I found particularly interesting surveyed parents who had guns in their home. And many of these parents reported that they were absolutely sure that their children did not even know that there was a gun in their home. But when researchers interviewed the children, not only did most of those children know that there was a gun in their home, they knew exactly where it was. Kids are inquisitive, and they're aware of a lot more than we think they are. There is an organization called Grandparents Against Gun Violence that has developed a program called ASK. Have any of you heard about that? 
It strongly encourages parents. If you are a parent of a young child and your child wants to go play at another child's home, don't be afraid to ask those parents if they have a gun in their home. And if that gun is properly stored, if it is locked up. And I have to admit that when my kids were in elementary school, that thought never ever crossed my mind. It probably should have, but I didn't think about it. But that's the reality of the world we live in nowadays. We have to be able to ask those questions because it's just not okay to have one to two children a week dying accidentally from guns. <coughs> Proper storage is important. I think we can all agree on that, but it can't stop there. Training is also important. It's estimated that 15 teens and adults take their own lives or someone else's life accidentally every week. People often buy guns now believing that that gun is going to make them more safe. But if they don't get the proper training, they may have just made themselves less safe. We have people buying guns that didn't grow up in households with guns. They didn't grow up learning how a gun should be cared for, how it should be stored, how it should be used. And if they have never been taught those things and they walk out of a store with a gun without any training at all, can we truly believe that they're now more safe than they were before that? We insist that somebody gets trained before they can operate a car. Shouldn't we insist that people get trained before they're able to walk out with a gun? In Minnesota, to obtain a permit for a handgun, you have to meet some basic requirements. You must be 21 years of age. These are handguns, not hunting guns. You must be 21 years of age, complete an application, which, under, which makes you undergo a background check, and especially in Minnesota, not show up on any of the gang databases. You have to be a resident of the county in which you are requesting the permit and provide a certificate showing that you have completed an authorized firearms training course. <coughs> Once purchased, a mandatory seven-day period takes place in order for that gun to be obtained. Now in most places in our country, you have, in order to buy a gun, you have to fill out an application for a permit and undergo a national background check that certifies that you are not in a category of people who should not have guns. And there is usually a seven day waiting period. But much of the debate surrounding gun ownership has to do with people who are able to buy a gun without a background check. And that happens at gun shows, it happens in person-to-person -person sales, and it happens through certain websites like armslist.com, which is quite an interesting website to go on, I discovered. It's kind of like Craigslist for firearms. In Minnesota, when I went on that um, website, there were really relatively few guns that were available for sale. I think there were 35 total guns or gun parts that you could buy. But in some states, when I looked, there were hundreds, close to a thousand guns that were for sale. Um, all different prices on this website. In 18 states, we now have a penalty for any individual who sells a gun to someone who shouldn't have one. Someone who is on the list of people who should not own a gun. So background checks in those states are almost always done because people don't want to, to face the penalty. But 32 states don't have that penalty. In spite of all the debate that we hear on the news, even surrounding this issue, there is common ground. 66% of gun owners who are polled support mandatory background checks on anyone who buys a gun anywhere. 98% of non-gun owners support background checks. That's a lot of common ground, if you stop to think about it. That's a lot of common ground that we can work with. And one more area of common ground that I discovered was in the case of straw man purchases. That was another term I hadn't heard before. But a straw man purchase is when somebody goes in to buy a gun for you because you couldn't pass the background check. So they buy the gun and then they give it or they sell it to you. 87% of gun owners are in favor of mandatory penalties for anyone who does that. We have had some well-publicized incidents of that happening in our nation. In the San Bernardino shootings, the guns used were purchased by a friend for the people who did the killing. Those people could not have obtained a gun on their could not have obtained a gun on their own. And so they had a friend purchase their guns for them. And do you remember the killings at the Jewish Community Center in Kansas City not very long ago? 
That man who shot and killed three people at that center had a friend go in and buy a gun for him because he was a felon. He could not have purchased that gun on his own. Do you know what um, that man who purchased that gun for the person who killed those people was uh, indicted and he was convicted of falsifying the application for a gun and do you know what his penalty was for that? Two years probation and a hundred dollar fine. Most gun owners support a mandatory penalty of five years in jail for someone who does that. Basic safety classes, proper storage, limiting access, asking questions to keep our own kids safe, eliminating loopholes for problem gun owners, these are all things that actually most of us agree on. And they are things that we should work for. But this morning I want to challenge us to consider whether the tragic amount of gun violence that we see happening in our country and on the news almost every day, the misuse of guns in our country has more to do with what is going on in our hearts than with the laws that we currently have or do not yet have. So far this morning, I've given you more of a lecture than a sermon, <coughs> and I know that. But here's where I hope that changes. The one who knows our hearts best is revealed to us in the Word and in Scripture. The Bible doesn't talk about guns, obviously, but there is a lot of talk about weapons in the Bible, swords and spears and slingshots and rocks and other things. The first 15 books of our Bible are pretty but bloody, with a lot of violence and warfare. And right in the midst of those bloody, violent, warring times, God raised up prophets who saw visions and spoke of a different way of being together. And by doing so, by speaking those visions out, by giving us those promises, they tell us that our use of weapons against one another is evidence of something broken inside of us. Isaiah lived during a violent time. And he spoke of that time when the Messiah would come, when spears would be beaten into plowshares, when there wouldn't be violence and warfare anymore. These prophets knew all too well that they did not live in that time yet. But they looked forward to it. They spoke about it, they witnessed to it, they hoped for it, they promised it. We don't live in that time yet either, but we shouldn't lose sight of that vision. Jesus made some interesting and rather complicated statements regarding weapons. If you remember, shortly before he is arrested, Jesus tells his disciples that they need to have a sword for self-protection. Even though he tells us, blessed are the peacemakers, we can't make the case that Jesus says we shouldn't have any guns or weapons at all, that we shouldn't protect ourselves if necessary. He doesn't say that. He tells his disciples to pack their sword. But then during his arrest, when Peter pulls out his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest servant, what does Jesus do? He heals that man and he tells Peter to put his sword away that those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Now that might seem to be contradictory. Have a sword for safety, but don't use it. Here's how I see those two statements. Jesus tells the disciples to have a sword for protection, but not to use that sword to defend him. Later we know that as the disciples went out to spread the good news of Jesus coming into this world, of his death, that brought forgiveness of sin and of his resurrection that brings new life and hope, they didn't go as fighting people. They went out in peace, even to the point of death for themselves. <coughs> the verse we heard this morning that is perhaps the most convicting is the verse from the Psalms. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. These were the things that were used in battle during that day. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. As Christians, I think the question for us is where do we find our security? Is our peace tied to a Smith and Wesson? Do you know how many people are killed each year by bad people? About 10,000. 10,000 people a year are killed by bad people who want to kill somebody. More than three times that many people are killed in car accidents each year. Almost four times that many. 
We know that a certain amount of gun deaths happen to people engaged in risky behavior, gang membership, drug use and sales, and things like that. But when I think about that, I wonder, do we really need to be so afraid? Do we really need to be so afraid of violence happening to us? Neither more guns nor more gun laws, as politically divisive as these are, neither one of these are ultimately going to bring us peace. They are only band-aid solutions. Our true source of peace comes from giving ourselves every day to Jesus Christ. When we start our days offering ourselves to God, to be used by God however God might choose, then we begin to know real peace. And when we follow Jesus' teaching and example, we find ourselves working for peace. If we really want to see inner city violence diminish, then maybe we need to invest ourselves in inner city schools. Maybe we need to make sure that all of those children learn how to read and they grow up feeling loved and wanted. We need to find ways to give people real hope of getting out of poverty. If we want to stop mentally ill people from becoming violent, then we need to invest money in research and treatment for mental illness. If we are truly concerned about the propensity of some people to become violent as they grow older, then maybe we need to take a look at the movies and the television shows and the video games that we use for entertainment that glorify and glamorize that kind of violence. And if we want to overcome the hate and the violence that marks our world today, then we need to live and share the love of Christ with those we meet every day. We need to invest ourselves in kindness and goodness and righteousness. And if these don't sound like much to you, if they sound like so little in a world that is so broken, then you need to go back and read your Bible again because these are God's ways. And God's ways are indeed powerful. Guns legally obtained and owned, properly stored, and rightly used, are really not the problem. If you are searching for real peace, you only get that from trusting Christ every day as your Redeemer, your Savior, and your Lord, and sharing that good news to our broken world. Let us pray. <coughs> Holy, almighty God, you do know our hearts. You know our fears and our doubts, our hopes and our dreams. Help us to hold to that vision of the day when all violence will cease. And until that day, help us to spread the news of your love and grace freely given to all people. Help us work together to find ways to protect innocent people from harm. Help us to be the people who invest ourselves, who give of ourselves, who work to fi find peace to promote peace, to create peace in this world. As Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 